Hello, welcome to Mark Langley's Horsemanship Podcast, a podcast helping people to understand their horses better, to provide solutions in a calm, connected way. I'm Jenny Barnes. And I'm Mark Langley. Hi, Mark. The first question today is from a new member, Michelle. So welcome to the group, Michelle. Michelle has got a Morgan who she's going to be part leasing. And she sounds like she could be quite a sort of a dominant horse. And she says that no one sets boundaries with her. Now, Michelle would like to get to know her and start off on the right foot. Um, She was going to look at trying to do the challenge, but the challenge, of course, takes place over eight weeks. And um, she's only got a couple of days, really, where she can give her full attention to this horse. She's found your teaching body language and a pushy and mouthy horse for you to be really relevant, but she's wondering, is there anything else that she can do that you might recommend to help her to become a confident leader from the beginning? I might just add that she does comment that there has been a few issues with this horse as well. So she is under saddle Um, she pulls back when she's tied up. She cow kicks when she's mounted and she also kicks other horses when she's being ridden. She's not too worried about those. I think she's just wanting to really try and establish um, the right relationship and get off on the right foot. But we'd love to hear your thoughts, Mark. Um, I'd be a bit concerned about it all, to be honest. Um, everything, everything we're doing with our horses affects all you know all the little things. The kicking under saddle, uh, you know, if she's a bit funny with other horses, all that sort of stuff, and the pushiness on the ground. Um, that can all be anxiety related as in a horse. Um, so you see, anxiety is not necessarily the end of the world. Anxiety is a healthy thing and it's in, in, you know, horse herds and things like that. But negative anxiety that hangs around in a horse is from a lack of understanding, lack of clarity, uh, lack of connection and good feeling with the person and things like that. So the anticipation and anxiety of all the things that the horse doesn't understand adds up to a horse that won't stand still, pushes in our space, all those sorts of things. So so you have to fix, you, you know, you have to look at the whole thing, the whole picture, um, you know, not just the bits that annoy you the most, like the pushiness on the ground and stuff like that. You have to you have to take it in as a whole thing. Like, you know, you, you'd want the horse to be soft when you saddle it and you step on it and things like that. Um, because sometimes, you know, like what's human anxiety? Most human anxiety is us thinking about the future. So, so, you know, like we lay awake in bed or something like that, worrying about the next day because there's a, you know, a, a confrontational meeting that we have to do or something like that. So that basically the way we are around our, our family because of that meeting the next day or something like that um, suddenly, you know, means that we're sort of snappy and anxious um, and not as calm and centred as we usually would be. So... So that's why I think, you know, you can always fix something that you notice at the start, but some horses are anticipating the future as well. So so I think you have to fix everything. But um, going back to the original question, um, the, the most important part of the question, which you were concerned about is, is the pushiness, the, the things like that in your space is um, you, you just, when you do something, you have to be clear enough to make it, um, you know, I, I, I don't like, I, yeah, no, I will be saying this, you have to be big enough or whatever you do has to be big enough or clear enough to say um, that's not available. So, you know, if you said push back and push back and push back, you're buying into it. Every time the horse pushes on you, you push on them, you're buying into it. And um, it's 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 um, just becoming a push-push uh, scenario. So so when you do, like, you bang a flag or bang a leg or do something big, it's it's big enough to say let go of that. And the horse understands. And what, 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 so what you've got to understand, what you've got to look for, is did the horse let go of that thought? So as soon as the horse steps back, you'll stand quietly and strong. Um, and then again, once they step in, you'll do it again. Um, sometimes you can put a, a, a like a, a, a pop on a rope to say, you know, don't don't come in, um, but don't go chasing them backwards. You know, um, like a, you know. Just, just getting big on them, chasing them backwards for it. Uh, you don't want to scare them and you don't want to bring your boundaries to them. You just want to really clear up your boundaries. So something clear and big enough to say, let go of that. And as soon as they have let go of that, you're just standing there softly. But softly doesn't mean, you know, blowing in the breeze and getting pushed around. It's just calm with a smile on your face, knowing that that's your ground. 
So the other thing is I, I um, like I was just at Equitana and I had a couple of demonstrations at Equitana and the second demonstration was a big Frisian and he can get quite, uh, sorry, she, she can get quite bouncy uh, in different scenarios and, you know, moves a lot when you get on and moves a lot when you, when, when you first start to ride her and, um, and also she can be pushy in, in personal space and, so I didn't do a lot with that mare at the demonstration. All I did was walk around and every time I took a step, I owned that step. And I was very clear in my body language that that was the step that I was taking. And that's my ground for that moment until I take the next step. And I just kept moving in front of her all the time, uh, knowing that if she was sort of coming past me, I could always go in a new direction. But every step was a very grounded step. And she started after a while because, you know, I didn't really do anything to help her settle, but I did a whole bunch, if that makes sense. So um, it was it was how I was presenting myself and how I was presenting my directions and the way I stood still. Um, and so I could talk to everybody in the audience and explain to them about, you know, what, what, what my concepts were and stuff, but without doing a, a, a much at all. And within that space of time, she, she settled really nicely and started to become aware of my space things like that so that's the thing about what I get worried about by giving people a lot of tools and they're not grounded enough yet that's that's also a thing that you really got to think about so you know you've got to own your decisions um, and, and when I say be a little selfish it's not like selfish in a bad way it's uh, sometimes when we become horse trainers we, we, we become obsessed with our, our you know helping our horse with things and all that that we're actually obsessing over them and worrying about all the little things and the not so important things and stuff, whereas we forget about ourselves and our decisions that we make. So you have to sort of own your decisions all the time with a horse like that. Be strong. And, and by owning your decisions and being strong in yourself, what will happen is uh, instead of you being responsible for them not standing still, they'll become responsible for themselves. And, and, and I've seen so many horses at clinics that just start to go, oh, You've changed. You're quite strong, and you quite you believe in your decisions. You look like a good leader. Ah, oh, when you stand calmly, I'll stand calmly too, and and they they start to sort of feel that in us. So so, you know, when I'm saying you know get a little big to get the horse to change his thought, but you've also got to be very clear that when your horse is moving, you're not disturbed by that, and you know you can hold strong, and you don't buy into things emotionally all the time. And I think people are constantly buying into the little problems that well the, the they're not necessarily problems, little things that the horse is doing that the person sees as problems and, and then they become um, less centred. So I think that's all part of it as well. Um, so, yeah, if you, if you think about all that, you know, you can, you can help your horse a lot. So becoming a lot more centred and grounded in yourself, a lot more confident in your own decisions. Um, and there's quite a few videos online that will show about that clarity that's needed mm -hmm. and the grounding. So just have a look at those videos, Michelle and um, enjoy the, that time with your new horse. So just staying on that subject then, Mark, of um, people who are, have been doing some of the uh, work that you've got set out online, um, I've got a question here from Tanya, who's been getting her horse to walk past her shoulder. Now, this is the horse who you might recall from another podcast we did recently, where the horse, every time she tried to get him to do something, go backwards on the ground, he was actually biting that rope. So she's still working on that backwards forwards movement so he's a little bit more fluid so that he can come past the shoulder. But she's still having a few issues. Can I just let you explain what she, where she's up to and where she can go forward? Yeah, I, I had a look at a couple of little clips that you've sent through, Tanya. And, um, yeah, you've, I, I can see there's, there's areas there that the horse has to be um, a lot uh, softer in the basic leading. Um, so all the different things you're asking, the horse is still kind of – still bracy, still sort of wobbling around in its head a lot, still kind of, you know, on the forehand, um, not really thinking in the rain, um, things like that, not not really kind of comfortable with, with the pressure around its head. So it's kind of just like wobbling around, hunting a bit of release, and you can probably feel that in, in your horse. So its mind is kind of like not really in there. And something I'd sort of like to point out, I think when you're doing the leading, you've probably got about, uh, I don't know, maybe 15 centimetres of rope between your hand and the horse's chin or the knot on the halter, I would hold pretty well close to the knot. And the first thing I would I would probably do is hold the knot quietly 
and the horse will feel that little tiny bit of pressure, but it's not a pressure that's saying go this way, go that way. And I'd hold and I'd wait until the horse kind of wriggles itself and goes, what are you doing? What are you doing? And then, and then when it quietens in your hand a little bit, I just let the knot go. Um, because it, it seems to be like, you know, the horse is just, you know, it, it looks a bit like a worm wobbling around in there, um, not really sort of engaging with it. So I would firstly do that, hold the knot till the horse softens and just kind of puts its thoughts in there and just is comfortable with the bit of pressure knowing that you've, you've, you're holding that knot. Um, and that's really important. A lot of horses are just looking for release or hunting release all the time. And they think any bit of pressure, they've got to start wobbling around and sort of find a hole somewhere. So that was the first thing I would look at. The next thing I'd look at is in your hand, I'd say now, I want you to soften through your body. And as you pick up, um, if they push, firm up. So if the horse leans out and pushes, don't just go at a steady pressure. Because what I noticed as well is as the horse was kind of wobbling a bit, your hand gets taken with the horse a bit. So sometimes you might have to lock into your shoulder a little bit with your hand. And when the horse pushes, step into a push and, and, and kind of bounce the horse back a little, not with a bump or a, a big thump or a, an electric bump or anything like that. You just give it, a, give it a push to say that's not available. And then as soon as the horse moves its feet, so, so when it moves its feet, you might find that it's taken it off balance a little bit and then it stopped pushing and then you loosen your hand a little bit, okay? And and uh, I, I would get a bit clearer when the horse pushes. So when the horse pushes, make pushing unavailable and then maybe ask just one or two soft steps and then just wait a little with your hand on the knot, not asking anything. And then when the horse is quiet, then release your hand and let it stand quietly. So hold the knot till the horse is quiet, ask for a yield. When you when you get a yield, if, um, keep your hand on the knot until the horse is soft after the yield and then release, whether that be left, right, doesn't matter which direction you're going, forwards, backwards. Um, but when the horse decides to wriggle and push and just kind of flounder around in there and it leans into any one of those boundaries, just firm up, push and say that's not available. So the horse stops thinking that, oh, your pushing is available. So I think you were sort of asking quite softly, but then the boundary was a bit vague in your hand. So what was happening is, 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 is you weren't really connecting to the thoughts and the feet as well as you should because the horse wasn't really engaging with it enough and, and, and soft with it. So, so I'd, I'd just work and don't do a heap of stuff like leading past until the horse is comfortable. It's picking up more in the wither, so it's uh, softer in the front end. So you can still do the picking up and, and go up and back a little and get the horse to kind of lift and back up a little. And uh, so every time you pick up, it's getting soft in the feet, not just kind of wriggling its head too much. So yeah, if you, if you kind of look at those things, it's still, you're still going to be doing the same thing, but you're just going to be a little, a little clearer on the boundaries, uh, which, might, which is going to mean probably firmer. Um, and that'll clear that up and the horse will start to go, well, I know that's not available. I'll start to follow the feel. Um, but, but I think he's looking for too many holes that he thinks available. Excellent. Some great ideas. Thank you, Mark. Okay, so moving on then. So Tony has also been listening to your last uh, podcast recently that was about picking up a foot that's within a horse that strikes. And one of the things that you were suggesting to do was when you um, are teaching a horse to pick up its feet to actually get the horse to move and, and also sort of get it used to being moving whilst you're touching their legs. Now, Tony has a mule. You're familiar with her, Molly. Molly the mule. Um, but unfortunately, with all the rain that we've been having, she's got mud fever and she is not letting her touch her legs at all. She starts kicking. So she's been moving down all the four legs, as you were showing with in one of your videos with Coco and also the, the Q&A when you talked about um, kickers touching their legs on the move. But this inadvertently made her not stand still for the farrier last week. And she got into a little bit of trouble for trying to kick. I shouldn't laugh. But um, so she's just wondering, did she get the exercise wrong? Um, should she have, how on earth does she treat that mud fever, which is moving up her hind legs? Mm -hmm. so, this, so this one's not about the mule though, is it? It's about um, her other little um, uh, yearling or two. Oh, yeah. sorry, this is about her black yearling. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, her black sorry. yearling, yep. No, no, that's fine. Um, so Tony, is the, I, I think I confused you too when I came and gave, uh, when I went to your place and we did an individual lesson, is you'd, you'd watch the Coco videos and know that's all important information and important education. I did a completely different lesson with your horse 
Um, and I, and I kind of, you know, said, maybe she's not ready for the, the cocoa videos. So the cocoa videos are just in hand leading close up, uh, on their head, leading backwards and forwards until they can start to soften and, and getting the, and, and putting the hobbles on us until the horse moves into position. So where, if you do it right, the horse should have no problem standing if you do those lessons. But anyway, the reason on her I didn't do that lesson is because her mind was too bouncy um, and I thought she needs to be more centred. So I basically walked around when she got too close. I just sort of, um, you know, told her to sort of step back and I got her to follow the feel of the rope at a distance. So when, we, when you put the rope down, she stood quietly. When you picked it up, she followed it. When you put it back down again, she could sort of, like she was ground tying. So she started to sort of become more responsible and wasn't bouncing around everywhere in her thoughts. So that's, that's super important and don't, don't worry about the feet. Um, I know if the farrier is coming, you have to worry about the feet, but the hardest thing when they've got mud fever is, uh, um, and, and for, um, mud fever for other people would know it as like greasy heel and it's a, it's a type of rain scald really. Um, and it's very, very painful. And some horses more than others, they, they're very sensitive to it. So when you start to touch it and pull it, it causes a lot of pain. So it's, it's very hard to sort of educate a horse to have his feet picked up and then also treat mud fever. So, so I, I, you know, so, you know, whatever you're doing, treating it, you, you'd want to um, be careful that you, you, you know, that the handling process could be painful. That's all. So um, it's important before you do any handling on the feet, with her that she's more centered so if you can stand there and just gently put the rope sort of like it's sort of neutral like it'd be laying on the ground nearly and if she moves you can say you know put a little feel up that rope a little wave up that rope to say that's not available and teach her that you know if she looks over there if she sort of starts to bounce around with her mind you can you can sort of say let go of that um alternatively you could walk her for five or ten minutes in the in that sort of yard the round yard or something around and every time she destinates you could reset her a little until she's more centered and sort of in a better headspace and then you go to some of your leading lessons um because if we don't you know this is a client i'm working with uh, with little brumby who when he's centered he can be really good but it's very hard to get him centered so so you know um she asked me a question the other day how come i'm not up to the saddling yet whereas at the clinic we were saddling him and i said well because when he comes in he's bouncing around a lot and and um when you're saddling a young horse you've got to have them in the good headspace that you, they're, they're right and they're listening to every moment of what you're asking so they're taking it all in um whereas if they're bouncing around you've got to be a guru in 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 holding a rope and putting a saddle on and all this sort of stuff so so get them more centered then start to do the leading lessons now if the leading lessons are correct and they work properly what will happen is when you quieten the rope she'll quieten and stand so I think by asking them to move around, that's only one part of the, the, the what I'm trying to teach. So, so when I pick up a feel on the rope and say shift, the horse shifts. But when I place the feel quietly, the horse quietens with the rope. So when you're doing your leading lessons, it's not about getting a horse to move so it can handle its feet on the move. It's just getting it so it can softly feel that movement is available so it doesn't freeze. And then in the long run, you've got a softer horse who picks up their feet better, rebalances better, and doesn't get all heavy and bracy. So what I would work on before you touch the feet is just lead, 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 lead ground where the horse just goes quiet. So you might lead and handle for a little bit, but the whole time that you're, 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 most of your attention is on that leading hand, knowing that the horse is following it. And then when she's following that leading hand, you just stop your leading hand and just keep the handling going while she's standing still. And that's where you can take your hobbles off a bit, uh, as in your emotional, it's emotional hobble. Just don't want to get people confused. You know, I'm telling everyone to go and put hobbles on. Um, so which means you can move your feet, handle her, and then uh, then you can sort of move her a little bit. And as she's moving, handle her and just, just do that. Just upper body, not where the mud, mud fever is, maybe from the hocks up. Um, and until she understands that following a feel is following a feel and neutral is neutral. And when she understands that, then you can gently go back down the hind legs again on both sides. Um, and I think that's it. The, 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 you know, that old saying, feel, timing and balance, um, that a lot of people have done a bit of horsemanship would have heard somewhere along the, along the way. Um, balance is the key. You do too much of one thing, there's always another half of that somewhere else. Uh, you know, there's always another half of the thing that you're doing. And, um, and that's the most important thing. And as, um, 
so yeah it doesn't matter if you're doing riding liberty anything there's there's always two halves to everything um, and you have to look at both sides of it and get the horse balanced so following a feel softly but also following a feel means when the feel goes still the horse followed the feel to the stop okay all right that's gonna get everyone thinking <laughs> So, um, next question mark is from Lisa. She's been doing the challenge, she's up to part three, but she has a horse that's really unhappy with the backup and, and part three is all about the backup. So she's wondering, are there any ways to tell if it's pain related or is he just having hard thoughts about it? So he takes a few steps to really start thinking backwards, sliding his back feet, his tail is swishing, He's yawning, and then he comes into her space afterwards with a hard eye and a grumpy, nippy attitude. He has had chronic lameness issues in the trot, and um, hence her concern. Okay, so just one little red flag is when you say chronic lameness issues in the trot, the, the other gait that is the same rhythm, not rhythm so much, but that's the, the same diagonal as it, is, is the um, is the backup so you know so the feet are moving the same in the backup except the trot's got the bounce in it and the backup doesn't um, so yeah so, so so you know maybe you can you could say that maybe the diagonal um, is is uh, you know causing your horse problems I did watch the little video of your horse and interestingly enough the right hind foot dragged a little bit more but that's common uh, in a lot of horses that are still bracy and sometimes all you can swap sides and they'll drag the other foot you know so you've got to do it from both eyes and, and things like that but what i did notice is your horse was pretty close to the diagonal and i it was only a very short clip of, of the back up so though the right hind dragged a little bit along the ground your horse wasn't doing like one of those four beat backups where the hind leaves and the front feet follow. It was actually close to being a two beat rhythm. Um, so, you know, it, and that was just off, off, off a standstill. So it's not like it had to back up five meters before it found the two beat rhythm It actually kind of got it straight away. So that, that, that was a, a good, a good sign. Um, now, by the way, the horse walked forward, the horse is braced in the walk forward too. the horses. You know, it doesn't matter whether you're backing or going forward, the horse's mindset never changed. It was, you know, it was uncomfortable about pressure. So um, putting aside pain for the moment, I have a feeling your horse is more, un, you know, I'm not there to sort of address pain, but, but by the looks of the expression, the way your horse is, the way it walked when it followed you, things like that, the way its eyes were, they were a bit hard to see. You can see its general demeanour was... Uh, a horse that wasn't happy about pressure and, and education. So um, so I say there's a clear lack of understanding and a lack of confidence with pressure, which is causing a lot of irritation, anxiety and brace, uh, which, which would have to be addressed, which means you've just got to go back to the pressure and say, um, you know, so it's not that you avoid pressure because if you avoid pressure, the horse will always think pressure's dangerous. So you have to come in with that, that, that rope and that rein and all that, that, that holder and say, here's an alternative. So I, I think... Uh, your horse, you know, fights and leans on pressure and it's not been sort of um, held long enough to find softness. So a lot of horses I meet, and more than 50% of horses at clinics, probably more than 70%, um, hunt release more than they sort of find softness in the field. So, um, and, and what, what I mean by that is no one's ever held the rein or the rope long enough till the horse actually found a comfortable space themselves in there. But, you know, everyone's always had to release the rope and say that's the answer. Um, so, so the horses actually walk backwards with a brace, and then we go, thanks for backing, release the rope. The horse never found softness in the backup. So, so that's why horses always back up braced, is because they never did a soft backup. They just got rewarded for going backwards, feeling not too good. So, so what you've got to think about is finding a soft backup. But what I would firstly do is I would get the horse comfortable with head pressure and like one of the other questions, hold the horse under the chin and just maybe lift it up a little, uh, just wriggle it a little until it just kind of wriggles and just starts to let go of some of the brace in its head and stop fighting in the head. So if you just push up and wriggle a little, you don't want necessarily want the feet to move. You just want the horse to sort of stop fighting that pressure around their head, much like if you just want to gently put a bridle on. You want to be able to 
just gently hold the horse there and the horse doesn't wriggle and try and get out of the little, like what it thinks is a, tra is a trap. So, so you just want them to sort of get comfortable and loosen up the head where his eyes soften up a little and say, oh, you've, you've got some pressure on my head. I'm okay. I'm ready to listen. And you can do that each day or like a lot of times, every time you pick it up, just do something till he softens instead of goes, what do you want me to do? Uh, like that. Um, so, and then once he's kind of accepted that, then you can go back to say, well, I want you to step forward. Now I want you to step back. I want you to step forward. And you, you want to continue something until he goes, I've stopped pushing and you felt him loosen in the body. You don't have to ask for a big backup or anything like that. You've just got to get him to accept the pressure first. Don't worry about that one foot dragging or anything like that. That will be fixed when he knows how to follow the pathway of feel. And then you can present that feel in a way that encourages him to pick up better, back a little stronger and things like that. But at the moment, I think I, I see a horse that's still resenting the pressure and fighting it like there's a trap coming. So until he's emotionally comfortable with that pressure, what's going to happen is he's always going to fight and brace through his body and the feet will always drag because his whole body's bracing, preparing for like a rugby scrum or something like that or a tackle of pressure. So, so, uh, and his mind's not going, I accept this, I'm going to go in the direction of that feel. So, so I would sort of really work on, and, and that, that means like, like the other question before is you've got to firm up a little when they push and say that's not available instead of having like flimsy arms where the horse just pushes them around a little bit. So, so you've got to be careful. Like, and sometimes, you know, the horse shoves us a bit and then it feels like there's a vague boundary out there. And then when we try and push them back, the horse goes, well, I don't really think that's going anywhere. I'm, I'm just going to sort of fight it because I don't believe in it. So, so yeah, you, you've got to just be clear with that and, um, you know, get the horse soft. And then when it pushes, firm up a little, but then just do little movements where the horse is going, I, I can, I can follow this feel, can I? Once you've got that, then you can start to say, now let's go with a bit of uh, a bit more urgency and let's go in a direction. The other thing that's going to help that hind, the hind feet in the back up is, but the, the problem with this is the way I do it. You, you know, every, over the 12 or so years I've been doing clinics, everyone's come, I can do a hind quarter yield and I'll go, show me. And then they just move their horse's hip over and the horse just punches its front feet down, braces and moves its hip around. So when I say you've got to get the horse yielding its hips, don't just go and sort of move its hip over in, in the real basic way that, that, that I see it commonly done. Um, you want to be able to lead that hindquarter over by lifting up the wither um, and getting the horse to softly move the hips over. So that leading forwards and backwards uh, before you get a good back up, you want the horse to sort of just come by and put a little bend in the twist so it just steps underneath itself and moves the hip over without just falling into your hand or fighting in the forehand and its head to push into your hand. So that will also be very, very good too. But sometimes you get a good hindquarter yield by doing a bit more forwards and backwards first. But as I say, don't do a big back up until the horse is just, you know, letting go of the brace in there and can do those little yields first. And then a stronger back up, good hindquarter yields, move the shoulders across, all that sort of stuff is going to really help. But just a softer, committed horse to that pressure. Marvellous. Thank you very much, Mark. And I hope that helps to all of you who've put those questions through. We've got more questions coming up very shortly in the next podcast. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Jim. You can learn more from Mark online through his online training videos. Just search Mark Langley Horsemanship. There's over 380 training videos which everyone has access to with a seven-day free trial. If you like what you see, it's just $15 a month from there. That's help where you need it.